this wasn't an ordinary missing persons case. We are looking at something that we don't see that often. You think in a thousand different scenarios, but something wasn't right. There were some red flags right from the very beginning. Breaking news. It's a category four hurricane. You can't stop storms from coming. It was essentially the opportunity for the perfect crime. Heavy rain is going to wash away potential evidence. There were no witnesses. There was no confession. Everybody at this point is going to be a person of interest. Who had the motive? Who had the opportunity and who had the ability to do it? Real Crime Profile is made possible by many wonderful sponsors from Madison Reed Hair Color to Stitch Fix Personal Shopping to Gobble Meal Delivery Service. So please, when you hear a special offer from one of our sponsors, do check it out and take advantage of it and show them your support for our show. You can also go to our website, realcrimeprofile.com, and see an up-to-date listing of the companies who help bring you Real Crime Profile and the limited time offers they have for our listeners. Remember, we can't do our show without you, and we certainly cannot do it without our sponsors. So thank you all for supporting Real Crime Profile. This mom mysteriously vanished as the state of Texas was bracing for Hurricane Harvey. Now her loved ones fear she may have met with foul play. We, we, we feel very, very confident that she's not a victim of this storm. Now her loved ones are thinking the unspeakable. Was Hurricane Harvey used as a smokescreen to cover up a terrible crime? Hello and welcome to Real Crime Profile. This is Jim Clemente, retired FBI profiler, former New York City prosecutor and writer-producer on CBS's Criminal Minds. And with me today from across the pond is... From rainy and grey London is Laura Richards, former criminal behavioral analyst from New Scotland Yard and founder of Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service. And I am Lisa Zambetti. I am the casting director of CBS's Criminal Minds. I have a real interest in real crime and the minds that solve those crimes. And with us today is a very special guest. I'm Elizabeth Austin, and I am from the Reno, Lake Tahoe area of Nevada in USA. And what is your job, Elizabeth? Well, technically CEO of Weather Extreme, but I'm a forensic meteorologist and I reconstruct weather for litigation purposes, but uh, weather can be from skiing accidents, car pileups, murders, bombings, you name it. So you're the cross between weather and crime. I am. That's awesome. We have you on because it's a fascinating field, this forensic meteorology, which I had never heard of, and I know many of our listeners had never heard of, but also because you are starring in a new television series on the Weather Channel, which is such a brilliant idea. I can't believe it hasn't been done before, but it's called Storm of Suspicion, and it is all about weather and how it relates to crimes. That's right. That's right. And it airs, well, the, the first show... Um, is a, is a longer show and it has limited commercials, but it airs October 7th. And in the States here, it's um, 8 p.m. Eastern and 7 p.m. Central, Sunday, October 7th. Um, I cannot wait to see this. How many episodes did you do? Eight. Eight, okay. Yes, and they run every Sunday through November. And that's on the Weather Channel? Yes. And so each episode, it's a different crime? Is that the way it works? Yes, that's what's great about it is each episode it just focuses on one crime and gets into the details of the crime and how weather either helps solve the crime or help catch the killer. So it's quite interesting. And is it all around the country, these episodes, or is it only in places that sort of tend to have extreme weather systems that go through them? Oh, no. It's all over the country. And I remember when I was an FBI agent having to deal with weather and crime. And I think the biggest example of that was when Hurricane Katrina came through Louisiana. And unfortunately, around that time, there were several serial killers operating. Uh, I know Laura is familiar with a bunch of them because we covered them on a, a previous show that we did together, Killer Profile. But a number of those cases were really just completely destroyed because the police departments that had the evidence were completely flooded out. And so all that evidence was lost. They had to start from scratch. And that was a terrible thing, especially in the case of serial killers who go on to kill more and more. I, I hadn't heard that before. That's interesting. And storm of suspicion, sometimes some of the cases deal with investigators on the crime scene and 
trying to beat the weather, so to speak, if it's like, let's say a big storm coming in or flooding or something, it can really affect the uh, investigation of the crime scene. And so part of it deals with that. Yeah, if you just listen to the news, I mean, yesterday and the day before, there were was news about a tragic ferry accident in Tanzania. Um, and there were over 500 people on this ferry. It was overloaded. And hundreds of people are still missing. And it's because the weather came in and they had no visibility. And so they couldn't, they had to s- suspend rescue efforts. And that same kind of thing, I mean, it's rescue efforts, but I'm sure it's also a crime scene investigation because that ferry was very overloaded and probably should lead to charges. I saw that. Yes, that's interesting. That was on Lake Victoria, which is actually a huge lake. And uh, they do get a lot of weather there, different types of weather, a lot of lightning, thunderstorms, and in this case, poor visibility. It's just tragedy. I'd like to actually just circle back and um, for you just to explain a little bit more about forensic meteorology and you know what your background is in terms of how do you become a forensic meteorologist? Because I think some of our listeners would be really interested to hear that. Well, you know, what's interesting is I first heard the term back uh, when I was in graduate school, um, someone who worked for our National Climatic Data Center, which has now changed its name, but it's the official archiver in the U.S. for weather data. And um, he had worked there in the summer, and he mentioned the term forensic meteorology. And I did a double take, and I said, what is that? And he told me all about it, and I thought, this this is right up my alley. And um, forensic meteorology technically means reconstructing weather for litigation purposes, but a lot of people just use it generically for all types of reconstruction of weather for insurance companies, for I've even reconstructed trying to figure out old photographs and date old photographs for people, which is quite fun and interesting, especially when it's something unique like snow in Southern California back in the 40s, that sort of thing. So forensic meteorology can be reconstruction of all types of cases, like I said, from slip and fall type things to um, plane crashes, to murders, to to, to really, you name it, ski accidents, zip lines, parasailing, pretty uh, boating, uh, a lot to, you know, when you have severe weather too, tornadoes, hurricanes, winds, uh, microbursts. So every day is different and every day is interesting. And some of these cases can go on for years, actually, from the time uh, I get a call to the time I'm testifying in court if it goes all the way to court, it can be years. Do you spend much time in the courtroom? Is that where you tend to spend your time or is it teaching or um, consulting? What, what does your sort of day and week look like? It goes in waves. Of course, when a case goes to trial, then I'm just focused on that single case. But we also have special projects where we have weather forecasting. We run weather models 24-7 around the clock for various clients and, and projects. And then we also do some risk, weather risk assessment uh, and climate risk assessment for different groups and overseas quite a bit. So it, it really varies. And what was your lead up into this field? Like, can you just tell us about your scientific background? I mean, I think the technical term for you is like Dr. Smarty Pants. I mean, when I look at your VTAG, <laughs> it's like immense. I, 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 don't do science, or Jim does, and so does Laura, but I'm just in awe of anybody who can, you know, pass biology. So tell us what your <laughs> run up was and your training and how you became such an expert in all kinds of different aspects of the weather. And, and you're an ice scientist. Oh my gosh, you got to tell us about that. <laughs> well, interestingly enough, well, my background is atmospheric physics. I have my bachelor's in atmospheric science and my master's and PhD in atmospheric physics. Sure. But what's so great about atmospheric science and meteorology is as scientists, we kind of have to be a jack of all trades. We have to know about chemistry because of you know air pollution and chemical makeup of the atmosphere, a lot about fluid dynamics, physics, um, and of course, meteorology. Um, and so there's really so much that goes into meteorology and atmospheric science. I think a lot of people don't realize that. Um, and some new students may get into it and show up for a day of class and realize, oh boy, <laughs> this is a lot more sciencey than I thought. <laughs> uh, I loved physics. I thought physics was, it's one of the purest sciences. I just love how it explains things that we see every day. It's such a, uh, I don't know, it's just such a practical science. 
I agree completely. Except for maybe physical chemistry. That was a little difficult. I agree with you with that too. <laughs> I'm sweating at just the word physics because I'm having a bad flashback. And what's mesoscale atmospheric modeling? That's one of the things that you do that sounds incredibly complicated. Well, it's just a kind of like means middle scale. Um, so the size of like a few states in the United States modeling that region. Mm -hmm. And um, then you can do a macro scale, you know, more of a gotcha. climate type. Thing. And then there's micro scale where you can look at uh, just it layers of uh, the atmosphere, let's say in a city or even in a park or something. So is that always just reconstructing what happened in the past or do you do predictive modeling? We do both. We do in the past and predictive. And for example, there's a project we have called the Perland Project. And I've been on the Perland Project since 1998, if you can believe it, and it's to get a manned glider, uh, no engines, two pilots to 100,000 feet. And this past September, I mean this month, uh, in Argentina, we just set broke our own world record and set a new world record of uh, 70, a little over 76,000 feet pressure altitude. Wow. So, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So can I ask you, do you use chaos theory to predict the weather? Well, the, the models that we use are just based on the physics of the atmosphere and the equations in the atmosphere, and also they take into consideration the type of vegetation, type of land, ocean, all of that. And so it may be embedded in there somewhere, but no, not technically. Okay, so, but how far out can you actually accurately predict the weather at this point? Me or what people claim they can do. <laughs> <laughs> You tell us what they claim, and then you tell us what the truth is. Well, some people claim they can predict it out one year, <laughs> which uh, um, I don't, uh, I'm not sure I buy that one, but uh, some people do claim. So that would be more, in my estimation, of more of a climatology type look. And for people who aren't, the difference between weather and climate, there's a saying, weather Climate is what you expect, but weather is what you get. <laughs> so um, in terms of weather forecasting, uh, if you go out, I mean, some people are now going out a few weeks, uh, but the forecasts get better and better as you get obviously closer and closer to whatever time period is you're looking at. Mm -hmm. But going out, you know, three, four eight days, three to eight days, that's a that's a doable thing. We're going to get back into the true crime aspect of it in a second, but just on a personal note, like when you were a kid, were you like laying on the grass one day looking up at the sky and saying, I want to know what makes those clouds? Or or did you have like a big weather event in your life that made you, you know, have to, what, what is your, how did your passion lead you into this? Probably through, I loved science, all types of science, um, whether it was insects or animals or reptiles or uh, things like physics and, and that sort of science. But I also loved all kinds of sports like skiing and volleyball and surfing and everything. And so I think my love of the outdoors, mm -hmm. weather is, of course, an integral part in, you know, whether you go skiing or whether you're going to go surfing um, in terms of what kind of snow are you going to have? What are the waves like? And so it became just an intimate part of my life and I just enjoyed it. It's a huge part. I'm exactly the same. I look at the weather all the time, either to surf, I'm on magic seaweed, or, you know, when I'm going skiing. I, I'm very obsessed with it, I have to say, but I think you might be more so, actually. <laughs> you've, you've, you've dedicated your life to it, so I'm going to give you that one. But I, I did hear that the weather apps, you know, is like the second most popular app. And, you know, the, the weather and climate obviously affects everything that we do. And we don't always think about that in our daily lives, behaviorally. That's exactly right. And, you know, it even affects uh, the GDP here and the gross domestic product um, in terms of the United States. And it's just a huge impact globally in terms of its effect, whether it's a big climate event, um, weather event uh, that's going on or just a day to day thing in terms of a heat wave or something, how it affects power. It just affects our lives all the time. Well, I've heard that there are now existing about 250,000 weather stations around the world, and that's how we can predict maybe eight to 10 days ahead, because we see the patterns coming and the things that are going to clash. And is that a fairly accurate statement? 
Well, yes, and it's becoming even more so because if you think about it, all of the people who are now wearing, you know, the Apple Watches and um, in cars, and there's more and more monitoring of weather and temperature and uh, all those sorts of things. Now, it doesn't always mean that these are calibrated and everything, but if, let's say, you have uh, 100,000 people around a certain area wearing an Apple Watch and all recording things at the same time uh, that, that's a lot of data yeah well that's what I, I what i was going to ask is what if we made every single cell phone on the planet a, a little mini weather station i mean wouldn't we be able to predict accurately for a year i mean let's face it there are like nine billion cell phones on the planet I, right now <laughs> i know but uh it's one thing to take all of the data and then it's another thing to be able to model out an entire year weather-wise mm -hmm. weather-wise you know right but uh, all i'm saying is it, it should the the more if we have two hundred fifty thousand now that we're using and we could potentially have nine billion i mean we could probably model it out for quite a bit further and be fairly accurate and and you have to remember though the atmosphere is you know three-dimensional so that would be at the surface so right. we utilize aircraft a lot a lot of the aircraft when we just go flying, um, unbeknownst to the passengers and, and even the pilots don't need to do anything. There, most of them are automatically recording oh, winds, wow. temperatures, and humidities. And um, an interesting thing is that during 9/11, when they shut down all air travel in the United States for that week period of time, the weather models became a lot less accurate. Wow. And then. Yeah, so they were able to do a test actually during that week, and they found that it made a big difference. Wow. Wow. Well, that was certainly a horrible time. Yeah. Yes. Well, speak about crime and weather. Yeah. I mean, that was, uh, I mean, it was a beautiful, clear day. I yep. mean, it was probably chosen for that reason um, because visibility was perfect. And, That's right. Mm -hmm. And what a, what a terrible way to use the weather against mm -hmm. us. You know, it seems like every day there's a company in the news or a social media website that's been hacked, and it's clear that everybody's a target, even you, me, and even our kids. You know, the hacker with the right know-how, they can easily intercept our data, they can track our online activity, they can steal our passwords, and compromise all of our personal information. So to protect myself and my family, I now use ExpressVPN. So ExpressVPN has an easy-to-use app that run seamlessly in the background of my computer, phone, and tablet. Turning on the ExpressVPN protection only takes one click, and it secures and anonymizes your internet browsing by encrypting your data and hiding your public IP address. So using ExpressVPN, I can safely surf on public Wi-Fi, which I hardly ever do because I'm always nervous that somebody is going to get into my data. And I don't have to worry about being snooped on or having my personal data stolen. And for less than $7 a month, you can get the same ExpressVPN protection that I have. ExpressVPN is rated the number one VPN service by TechRadar and comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So protect your online activity today and find out how you can get three months free at ExpressVPN.com dot com slash real crime. That's E X P R E S S V P N dot com slash real crime for three months free with a one year package. So visit expressvpn dot com slash real crime to learn more. Anyone can go back and get some idea of what weather was like on a certain day, but that's not going to hold up in court. That's where a forensic meteorologist comes in. You need something that's certified. Uh, the big difference between, you know, taking, let's say, a tape of your broadcast or a copy of the Boston Globe or other published information is that it's not certified as a, as a record. Like any meteorologist, he has access to weather data. But Gilman also keeps records that he can certify if called upon in court. Since he's a meteorologist, his expertise gives him credibility and can make or break a case in court because weather can often be a valuable clue in solving a crime. Dr. Austin, what was your first case where you really got deep into a case about crime and had to use your expertise to 
to full advantage? Um, probably the one that where I, uh, was it was a double murder death penalty case, and um, it was an elderly couple. They were murdered in their home uh, in the in the early morning hours, um, and it was a brutal, brutal murder. It was terrible, and so I had to go to the, of course, the crime scene afterwards, um, and you know it was all. They had already done their investigation and everything, but I went there to make calculations for things like the hills, the hills, the terrain for lighting conditions. Just look around, and, and uh, I take a lot of different measurements while I'm there, and that was probably probably a big one. Where was this? It was a place called the Inland Empire down in Southern California. Sure, sure, sure. And so, what did your uh, measurements do for the case? Like, how did they use that? Well, I testified as to the time I was given uh, that the murders occurred. Um, I guess there was a little bit of discrepancy in that, but so I just testified to the facts of the lighting conditions throughout the night and the early morning hours, mm -hmm. and to the cloud cover, the humidity, and if there wasn't any cloud cover, and to d talk about the atmospheric lighting conditions. So how did you get involved with this, um, with the show and, and those cases? And, and can you just kind of take us into that? Sure. Um, and by the way, the reason I did lighting conditions is because there was a, an eyewitness that said he had seen the murderers go in. And so that's where my role was. But um, someone had read my book and I discuss and it's not just forensic meteorology but that's part of it and so they contacted me um, someone from the weather channel or um, the uh, company entertainment company working with them and so they called me up and talked to me on the phone and then I did a Skype interview and then they hired me for for the show and it's been great what's the name of your book treading on thin air We'll link that on our Facebook page and on our uh, on our website um, for people to check out. It's it's actually written for the general public, even though uh, on the front of it it talks about atmospheric physics and this and that. But it's for the general public, and it's just a book about. It's kind of a combo uh, memoir and all about the weather and how it impacts our lives. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I know that in. In cases that I've worked, um, the Vince Foster equivocal death investigation in Fort Marcy Park outside of Washington D.C., I mean, we we had to look at the weather and what conditions were happening because there were so many allegations that he was actually murdered and placed there, and but there was no forensic evidence of anybody else being around and so forth, and people were saying, well, that could have been washed away by this, that, or the other thing, and. We looked at, at the rain schedule, and then Dr. Lee, who was working with me on the case, said, well, it did rain the next day, so since the, the body disposition site was on the top of a berm, we went to the bottom of the berm and then sifted through all the dirt there and material there, and we were able to actually find gunpowder residue from that weapon being discharged at that location as opposed to it being discharged somewhere else and his body being placed there. So that really helped us. The fact that we found out it did rain and the fact that we were able to then search downstream from where the body was found, uh, we were able to help prove that he actually committed suicide on site there. Oh, how interesting. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting how weather can weave its way into solving a crime either in how the crime was committed or in terms of investigating the, investigating the crime later. And right. Trying, you know. A lot of times it gets in the way. I mean, like you said before, trying to get ahead of a storm when you're collecting forensic evidence at the site. I mean, it's very, very difficult. If it's snowing or raining, I mean, it's really difficult to preserve the crime scene. And if you're trying to get tire tracks or foot impressions or boot impressions, out anything exterior, boy, it, it really can wreak havoc on your case. That's right. That's right. And then in covering up, for example, a murder weapon, if it's really snowing hard or it's really windy, you may not find it until the spring during right. the thaw. Right. Especially if they've thrown it out of the car or driving away. Boy, that's going to be a tough one. 
And it can accelerate decomposition. I mean, Jim and I right. looked at that and talked about it in the Kaylee Anthony case in Florida. Exactly. Where, you know, she was, uh, uh, the body recovery site was a swamp-like area. So, you know, in Florida, in the height of um, the summer. So we spent a lot of time talking about the weather and conditions and how it accelerated decomposition in that case and left very little for the um, medical examiner in terms of autopsy. And we also talked about it with the Kathleen Peterson case, which we're covering at the moment, um, which is the Staircase um, Netflix show where Kathleen Peterson was found at the bottom of the stairs. And I recently talked about the fact that a forensic meteorologist actually gave evidence to the point that there's a question mark that we have, um, Dr. Austin, about the timeline where it was December the 9th and the weather, it was... In, in terms of the conditions, it had been a, a warm day, but it was about 12 degrees, which I think is about 56 Fahrenheit or thereabouts. And there's sort of a two hour window where he, Michael Peterson, claims that he was that he and his wife had been outside and sat, sat by the pool for a period of time. And she then goes in to the house. She sends an email to a work colleague and that's at about midnight. And he claims he stays out there for a couple of hours and he's wearing shorts. And, you know, he says that he's smoking a pipe. Well, we, we were debating the forensic meteorologists who gave a testimony to say, well, in, in those conditions at that time to be static and to be stood by a body of water in a pair of shorts, it would probably have been, you know, he would have been out of his comfort zone. Um, and we debated whether that was the case or not, what someone's comfort zone is, because there's two and a half hours that he then calls the police and paramedics saying at 2.40 in the morning that she's still breathing where he's gone into the house and found her. Uh, but he can't really account for the for the two hours, that time period. And then he says, well, he was outside, he was standing there, he was smoking, and you know whether that is viable given it's December and he's wearing a pair of shorts. Right, right. Uh, very circumstantial, but uh, definitely something that if you had some other evidence to go along with it, I think would would sway a jury. And do you ever get asked about, uh, you know, the ambient temperature and the body temperature to calculate time of death? Do they use your information for that? Uh, yes, they'll use, I won't do the calculation of the time of death, but they'll use... Um, the data from, you know, the temperature and humidity uh, and that sort of thing. And of course, sometimes there's the issue of the body's been moved perhaps, right. um, or a, a lot also temperature plays a huge role in entomology in terms of what kind of little insects are, or eggs are found on the body. Right. And then they time it because they have a very specific time frame. these insects of when they lay their eggs, when the eggs hatch, what, what size yeah. the insect is. So, yeah, yeah, Laura, you remember Dr. Wayne Lord. He he was my boss at the Behavioral oh, Analysis please. Unit, and he yes. was a forensic entomologist. And so he would he would date um, and sometimes time death by the the level of insect infestation and what generation of of you know flies or larvae were found on the body. I mean, it was amazing how accurate he could be. And there's, you know, obviously a lot of work being done at the body farm where they actually have bodies out exposed to the elements in various different sets of circumstances. So they could actually, you know, give examples of how long it takes for a certain level of decomposition or a certain level of insect activity to occur. Yeah, we talked about that in Sister Kathy's murder, too, about the weather and the, the maggots, if they were maggots, you know, on her face and, and things like that. Well, I think, it. remember, later in the series, it actually showed, I think it was Dr. Spitz said, there were, in fact, maggots mm -hmm. on, the, on the body. And so that confirmed what the witness had said. And how many cases have you advised on, would you say, Dr. Austin, in terms of, you know, crime cases, criminal cases? Oh, criminal cases, uh, f a lot fewer than, than civil cases. Oh boy, I'm not sure how many, but mostly there's civil cases that I work on, but it can still have uh, kind of a criminal element to it, but it'll be a civil case. Right, so that might be like an insurance fraud or something like that? Is that Insurance fraud or deception in terms of maybe some type of ride or outdoor event that they have where they 
just cut corners and they knew things were not working correctly and that sort of thing. That, that always scares me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you think about it, you know, uh, especially at, you know, carnivals and, you know, p things that, you know, that move around the country, you know, are they, are they really, really that safe? <laughs> well, I don't ride on anything at amusement parks anymore or uh, at carnivals just because from the years of doing this. Oh, really? Oh, no. <laughs> that's, that's good to know. <laughs> Particularly from an, a fellow adrenaline junkie when you like to ski and surf and climb mountains. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that as some good advice, I think. Um, well, I'm sure there are plenty of them that are fine. I just, uh, <laughs> I just don't do it anymore. <laughs> so would it be fair to say that when a, a big storm event is coming or a big weather event is coming, that offenders see that as a great opportunity to do some kind of crime? Well, they may. You know, this is, uh, interestingly enough, um, when I see big hurricanes coming toward the, the coast of the United States, I, I wonder if people are thinking, oh, about this, you know, these evil people, that this would be a good time to commit a crime or perhaps rob a bank or something along those lines. But usually criminals aren't smart enough to outsmart the weather. They don't realize that there's just so much going on weather-wise that I don't think they can account for, for everything. Well, I think ever since the song Rainy Night in Georgia, right, isn't that, uh, is that the song or the night I can't remember. That's, that's the, the night the that night. the lights went out in Georgia? Yes, that's it. That's right. it. <laughs> the night the lights went out in Georgia because it was actually, it's a song about covering up a murder, right? Is it's it? The wrong person. <laughs> yes, the wrong person gets gets convicted. <laughs> it was, her brother gets convicted and she's the one that did it. <laughs> I never I, even parsed yes. that out of the lyrics before. Me either. Oh my God. Absolutely. <laughs> You know, I'm always thinking about putting healthy ingredients in my body, but lately I've also been concerned about the ingredients I put on my body too. The stuff in most deodorants like aluminum, parabens, phthalates, they make me really nervous. And the only thing that makes me more nervous is using a natural deodorant that doesn't work. So that's why I was so excited to try Kopari. Kopari is a natural deodorant that works. It fights odor with plant-based actives such as sage oil and coconut oil, and it outlasts your longest days. And don't just take my word for it. Kopari's gotten a lot of love from editors at Cosmo and People and thousands of five-star reviews on Kopari's website. Kopari deodorant doesn't leave behind a sticky white residue at all. It goes on clear and it has a very subtle, sweet scent that I really love. In fact, I went to the office the other day at Criminal Minds and I said to my staff, come smell me, come smell me, don't I smell good? Anyway, but that's just me. So Kopari is free of silicones, sulfates, parabens, GMOs, and baking soda. And it's really great for sensitive skin. Reordering Kopari is really easy with a deodorant subscription. Just choose how often you want to receive it, and they ship it to you automatically for free, so you never run out of deodorant again. And best of all, Kopari offers a money-back guarantee, so there is no reason not to try it. Go to koparibeauty.com slash real crime to make the safe switch today and save five dollars off your first order when you subscribe. That's Kopari. And <laughs> and yes, yeah, she talks about it. She ended up killing this guy, but I think her brother gets locked up for it right. in the song. See, I thought it was about an execution and like the lights went out because like the energy of the ex I had a whole different story. It maybe it is too. I'm not sure. Yeah. If, if I were, uh, you know, wanting to kill my wife or whatever and, and a storm is coming, in the chaos that ensues, you could, couldn't you just, you could stage it pretty easily, couldn't you? You could, in terms of law enforcement are busy, people are busy, if, especially if the evacuations are going on. Um, but there's still a lot of elements that can catch a criminal weather-wise. Right. But if you look at sort of what happened and all the crime that occurred and all the chaos that occurred during Katrina in Louisiana. Remember, Laura, there were three, at least three, up to five, maybe. There were up areas. to five. Yes. Yeah, five of them were known about. Yeah, that they were investigating. And at least three of them, I know that evidence was destroyed. And one of the guys, Dominique, moved north because he couldn't, his wherever he was living got wiped out. And he started killing again up there. 
and that's the only way he was caught was that that they had to start the investigation all over again right it takes a certain kind of mind you know and psychology to map things you know and exploit opportunities like that but but it does happen doesn't it israel keys is another up in alaska i was just thinking that laura oh my god that is crazy israel keys in alaska yes and he used you know terrain and different terrain and uh the snow as well which obviously the snow presents all sorts of different and difficult challenges right it's crazy yeah, there's another serial killer that would would unfortunately fly. Uh, he would pick up prostitutes and fly them up there and then hunt them. And uh, yeah, it was horrible. But he'd make them basically run pretty much naked in the snow, and he would hunt them down. Uh, it's just a horrible case. There's also people who will, who will use the weather or weather systems or water to try to cover up their crimes. And... So, you know, when a place floods or when the river's high and, and moving fast, you know, that can be a place to put a body that, that will be hundreds or thousands of miles away by the time it's found. Yeah, exactly. Very mm -hmm. difficult to actually tie that to a person. And once I, uh, I had a case that, that where they tried to use a river to make a suicide look like a murder. And what the guy did was he tied the gun to a, a string and a uh, gallon jug uh, with a little bit of water in it. And what he did was he sat on the bank of a river and he dangled the jug uh, close to the water and then pulled the trigger to kill himself. And what he intended was for that jug to carry the gun away from him so it would look like somebody shot him and they'd be looking around for the gun. Unfortunately for him, the bottle and the gun hung up the string hung up on some sticks right nearby so it didn't go away but he tried to use water to move that away to help stage it to make it look like somebody had killed him because he wanted his family to collect insurance oh. and they couldn't collect on suicide oh, yeah. oh goodness wow goodness so uh, we're all super excited to watch Storm of Suspicion. We can't wait, and what a great idea! And I'm so glad that we got a chance to talk to you. Well, we have much. All we right. have a lot more to talk about with Dr. Austin, so you'll have to tune in next time. Yes, okay. that's that'll be great. Can't wait to talk to you again, Dr. Austin. Till then, thank you for listening. If you like our podcast, there are a few things you can do. You can take two minutes and go to Apple Podcasts and leave a five star review. You can also check out all Real Crime Profile offers and promotions and our sponsors in our show notes. Another thing you can do is go to Facebook and like our Facebook page, and you can also follow us on Twitter at Real Crime Profile without the E. And one last thing, please tell your friends, family and colleagues about us and spread the Real Crime Profile word. Thank you so much for listening. We really appreciate all of our listeners. Real Crime Profile is produced and edited by Paul Francis Sullivan. Sound engineering by Mike Thal. Music is composed by Simba Tsumba. Logo art by Jim Clementi. Real Crime Profile is produced by XG Productions and distributed by Wondery. For advice and support if you're experiencing stalking in the UK, you can contact Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service on 0203 866 4107. Or you can go to the website where there's a lot of information and advice that you can follow on www.paladinservice.co.uk. If you're experiencing domestic abuse, you can call the National Domestic Violence Helpline for free on 0800 2000 247. In the US, if you're experiencing domestic abuse and need advice, shelter or counselling, you can call Genesis, the 24-hour hotline, on 214 946 4357. You can also go to their website for further advice or support, www.genesisshelter.org. And there's the Domestic Violence Hotline on 800-799-7233.